Celtics Lab is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Alrighty, welcome back to the Celtics Lab podcast brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network and BetterHelp. You deserve to be happy. I'm Cameron tip I'm joined by Dr. Justin Quinn. Alex Goldberg is on tour with Divine Sweater. Check him out. And we got the NBA draft coming up on Thursday. So to talk about that and a few other things, we bring in our friend from For the Win and USA Today, Brian Kalbrowski. Brian, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. The draft is in Brooklyn. The only one that I've missed since I've moved here uh, is the one that was the COVID year, um, which was actually probably the draft that I followed the closest because we be such a long draft cycle. Um, but I always love when all the prospects start arriving into town and we start getting some in-person events. So I'll be doing some stuff uh, in person tomorrow with, I think, Grady Dick. And uh, the next few days should be really fun. I've got red carpet for Thursday, which will be great. And I know Victor Wambanyama just landed in New York about an hour ago. Uh, so, yeah, it's a really exciting time. Yeah, uh, the reason my intro is extra fast is because we got a lot on our plate and I want to get right to it. Um, and I'm going to throw all of that out the window to think about what it's like to be Victor Wambanyama on a, a continental flight. Um, because it's going to be miserable. I mean, even on a private plane, they're not that, I just, I can't imagine. I'm so excited to see this person in real life. I I, I don't know. I'm just floored by this kid. Anyways, uh, we're going to talk about the draft, which is on Thursday. And Brian, you've been talking to prospects. You've been uh, scouting who's been working out with whom. And obviously, we'll focus on what the Celtics might be up to. But before we do that, we're going to talk about some of the trades, some of the coaching hires, and I guess a little peek at Summer League as well. So, Brian, uh, I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast knows that Bradley Beal is headed to Phoenix. Chris Paul, for the moment, is headed to Washington alongside Landry Shamit. And Phoenix exhausted every other draft pick trade and trick they could possibly pull. Um, Just what do you think? What are your thoughts on the trade about a day removed? A uh, day removed, I would say I hate it for both sides. Uh, so it's which a is good trade you, then. Yeah, which is how you know it's a good trade. Exactly. I I really uh, I really can't believe how how terribly the situation was managed in Washington to let Beal get uh, to the point where his value was that low. Um, if they had decided to pull the plug earlier, and this is not on the new management, you know, this is obviously uh, fixing someone else's mess, but that's on Tommy Shepard for, for letting it get to that point. Um, and tanking for the 2024 draft, which doesn't have uh, the marquee prospect that this year's had. You know, if they had just tanked, if they had just done this trade last year, they could have gotten, you know, more value and also gotten a better odds of getting Wambanyama. They almost got Wambanyama this year. I don't know if you just saw, but they were like one ping pong ball away. It was like a lot of different combinations that could have gone to to uh, to Washington. And the one that it went to was actually San Antonio. It would have increased their luck there. Even still, I mean, they could have had a real shot at Scoot Henderson, who's a franchise building block, uh, Brandon Miller, and they didn't do that. Um, now, I mean, just from the draft perspective, I think they should all in Washington keep their fingers crossed for a Thompson twin to drop to them. Uh, either one, I think, uh, preferably for them, uh, Amen Thompson, but I really don't think that'll happen. Uh, and then Phoenix, I mean, from a draft perspective, there's nothing to say about them ever. They've traded every second round pick and first round pick they could possibly trade. And they don't really use the draft anyway. They've said so on record, actually, if I believe uh, it's ESPN a couple of years ago in the future. Um, but, you know, from a roster building perspective, I don't really particularly understand it from Phoenix's perspective either. I, I, I just, I mean, you're getting, uh, you're getting just, you know, a, a similar player to Devin Booker. Um, and I think Bradley Beal's being underrated in these discussions lately. Um, he's a tremendous scorer, but uh, scoring is not really the problem that I think I would project yeah. Phoenix to have next season with Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and the roster. So I would definitely try to reroute Aiton uh, and try to get a real point guard. Um, and, you know, I think have just uh, Booker and uh, Beal on the wing. Um, but, you know, either way, I mean, I think it's a, it's a confusing trade for me. Uh, and obviously the Bartlestein connection uh, with Phoenix and Washington is uh, is really strong with this one. And, and uh, the, that's kind of the, the my first uh, my first thought right when it happened was, this must have been just Beal really flexing that no trade clause, and I don't think we'll see any no trade clause uh, used in the NBA by front offices anytime soon after seeing the way that it was managed. Because <laughs> I think you know, it, it, I think if 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 they really were trying to get him somewhere, they could have gotten at least probably Tyler Hero, and that's yeah. much more value than than Landry Shamit and Chris Paul's expiring. So 
Um, you know, it's a, it's a weird one. Uh, and I don't think it'll change the draft too much. Um, the one note I do want to add on the draft uh, for this, and I know I've been going on for a while now, is a lot of the rumors about who Washington likes so far as Anthony Black out of Arkansas. Uh, I'm a huge Anthony Black fan. Um, I think he could be a much more athletic, uh, more point guardy version of Kyle Anderson. I think mm-hmm. Anthony Black's a connector. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's much more of a player that would do well in a team that could potentially make the playoffs next year. Uh, an Oklahoma City or a Utah or a New Orleans or one of those teams that's in the lottery, uh, Portland even, um, but but not necessarily um, you know looking to rebuild completely. Washington's tearing it down. Kristaps is going to get traded probably on Thursday. Anthony right. Black is, is I, mean, I think he's a great culture guy. Uh, I think he's somebody who I would like to have on my roster, no doubt. My first pick that I'm going to use, I would like somebody who I could really give the ball to. It's like okay, this is our first pick since. We traded Beal, you know, since in the post John Wall era, really post John Wall, Bradley Beal era. I want to give, I want to draft a point guard who can really take the ball off the court and, and make some plays for my team for real. And and I think Anthony Black is a player who personally was, was really high on my my big board, but for Washington specifically, if I'm going to scrap it down, tear it for parts, I'm looking at the Thompson Twins and I'm looking at uh, Kobe Bufkin at Michigan. That's who I have uh, in my mock right now. I don't really think that anybody else has Kobe there quite high, uh, but I think that they should at least take a real hard look at him because I think he's a real uh, guard who could actually play that type of a role. Um, and I prefer to see Anthony Black on a team that you know has more of a winning mindset right away. Yeah, that's not the wizard. <laughs> no, no, not for not. a while. And yet, and yet he's being mocked there by pretty much everybody today. So um, you know, Jonathan Wasserman from Bleacher Report says lead circles believe that Black is going to be the pick something about that doesn't feel right to me. Um, and, and I think that, I think that Kobe Bufkin should be getting a little bit more looks there. Um, and I'm not sure if he will actually get picked there, but I think that someone like Kobe or one of the Thompson twins would be my pick if I'm, if I'm Washington. Dr. Quinn, what about the Phoenix side of the equation? What, what are your initial reactions to what the Suns are going to look like next season? New owner wants to make big splash makes bad decision. Basically, yeah. it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out because all the second rounders, the pick swaps, uh, those are kind of indicative of me of what we will probably be seeing iterations of in trades moving forward because of how we can talk about this a little bit more later. The new CBA is going to impact team building. Uh, but I think we might have just seen like the test case for what not to do, at least in terms of taking on salary. Uh Or at least we're going to see just how bad the punitive aspects of this are going to be for building a super team. I mean, I suppose it's one of those things, especially for a franchise like Phoenix, where one championship makes it all go away. But goodness, if they don't win one, it's going to look really bad. Yeah, Brian, to your point, I don't don't know. Beal, Durant, and and Booker could all score 30 points in a game, and and Phoenix could still get outscored by 15 because no one's playing defense. Uh, down in the valley. Um, I like all the players individually, and as well, that's a lot of money and not a lot of defense. Okay. Anyways, he was never going to the Celtics, Celtics fans. But even if you hoped he did, let's uh, let's put that to bed because it's behind us. Keeping things focused on Boston, they just hired Phil Pressy as an assistant and played for the team in 2013, 14, and 15. According to Adam Himmelsbeck of the Boston Globe, we just had a report out that we'll get to more so. Uh, Boston's expected to sign at least another assistant sometime soon. Brian, we've asked a couple of people this, um, but I'll ask you the same. What's your take on the criticisms of Joe Mazzullo's bench last year, and where do you think they're at now? You know, I wasn't really a fan of the coaching job uh, that I saw from the Celtics last year, but given the context, uh, it's so it's so understandable. Um, just okay. considering everything that they did to, uh, or just how little preparation time they did and how much they lost on the bench too. Um, you know, just with the assistants leaving as well to get head coaching jobs, there was just so much movement over there in such a short amount of time, uh, that, you know, I think Joe Missoula did a really good job of keeping the guys engaged and having a winning record. Um, you know, to me, it felt a little bit in the beginning of the year, uh, like he was getting a little bit of that Luke Walton effect where it was like, Oh, Missoula's doing a great job. These guys are doing so well. And I was like, I think that maybe, you know, either you two probably could have coached Tatum and Brown to a winning record early in the season because of how 
talented that roster is and how you know well they were playing off of the chemistry they've built the last several years you know it's harder to do that during the playoffs and i think that's when coaching really comes into light and that's why you see spolstra make the eastern conference finals you know however many years in a row and while you see spolstra um you know do so well over so many years now is he's clearly a great tactical coach and i think you know mike malone obviously is as well obviously he's got the huge advantage there with someone you know like Jokic on the roster but uh, I think Malone has done a tremendous job in, in Denver, too. Um, Missoula, it, I wasn't really a fan of the timeout decisions and all of that. But also, for me, in terms of my writing and my professional career, I've always hated, I think, the mo- one of the things the most is criticizing coaches and referees. Um, not because I think that they're, uh, it's just like, to, to me, it's like, I don't know. Everyone's got a reason for what they're doing here. And if I don't have the better answer, Joe Mazzulla knows a lot more about basketball than I do. And, and I think that he he certainly uh, was, was dealt a, a tough hand, but they've really done a great job uh, building that uh, bench back up. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, especially uh, the assistance that they've gotten for their, for their lead, you know, with um, Charles Lee, but that's his name. Mm-hmm. Um, Charles Lee was, you know, obviously from Milwaukee, the, a favorite for for many of the coaching positions that for head coaching position um and i i figured he wasn't going to leave until he could get a head coaching job so um you know i think that that's kind of got some like Ime Odoka vibes from a few years ago in terms of just you know where Ime's standing was in the league he was like considered to be you know the the, the next assistant to become a head coach and so he didn't get that um i think it's going to be a big hit for milwaukee losing that as well as adrian griffin as well as you know budenholzer uh so um, or not Adrian Griffin, Adrian Griffin's a new head coach. I've got so many things in my mind. Forgive me. Um, <laughs> either way, you know what I'm saying. A lot of transition going on in Milwaukee, a lot of talent going on to the uh, the bench in, in Boston. Um, and uh, Phil, Phil was just a coach in the call in the college ranks, right? Missoula, uh, Missouri, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, he he coached uh, Kobe Brown, who's one of the targets that I would actually like a lot for, for the Celtics. Um, and, and I think oh, that, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, that's something that I always keep an eye on. He's one of the prospects that I've interviewed for my draft prospect series. And um, obviously, you know, I don't think Brad's going to come in and immediately give the first draft pick that they have in this draft uh, to the new assistant coach. Uh, But it's at least worth monitoring uh, because Kobe Brown is somebody who I think checks a lot of boxes for a lot of teams. Uh, Somebody who I think Brad would uh, Brad would like. So um, I, I keep an eye on Kobe Brown. He's also older. He's like a win now kind of a player. Oh, I have to. That's why you're here. I would never have made that connection to a uh, Pressy. Uh, before we get into the draft stuff, Justin, what are we getting out of Pressy as a coach, other than perhaps this connection to this prospect? Well, I mean, he's got the connection to the team. Both he and his dad played for the Celtics, and I mean, it's going to be weird because he played with Marcus Smart, and now he's going to be coaching him uh, you, after Marcus Smart has like resoundingly had a much better career. But he does have the experience playing in the league, so it's going to be another voice in the demon Stoudemire kind of vibe where if they hear it from him, they're not going to tune it out the same kind of way that some players might tune out something from somebody who's never played in the NBA, for example. Yeah. Not, not every assistant needs to have the ear of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I mean, JD Davison needs, needs a go guy. I mean, there, there's a lot of people on this team that need coaching besides the top people. So if he can be helpful and behind the scenes stuff with the younger guys, that totally works. Um, Okay, we're, we're mostly here to talk about the draft, so let me just kind of recap this Himmelsbeck piece that came out a little bit. And basically, the reason I'm doing that is because it recaps a lot of, I think, what we know. Um, according to the Boston Globe, according to Adam, Boston is indeed looking to change the backcourt rotation, that there's a little bit of a logjam there. Um, but importantly, according to a source that talked to the Globe, I'm quoting, financial obligations will not guide the roster decisions, as in it's not that they're going to try to cut Malcolm Brockman's salary for the sake of cutting salary it's that uh, a rotational wing or a a big would make more sense than having four playable guards so brogdon and peyton pritchard continue to be the names to monitor but it sounds as if boston's taking a lot of calls there um the globe is also reporting that grant williams is likely back in boston however teams have called uh, about possible signing trades and i'm sure there are teams with cap space that might throw an offer his way the Pacers reportedly uh, have interest in Grant Williams. The Mavs also, although I don't really know. I don't think anyone knows what's going on with the Dallas Mavericks right now, including the Dallas Mavericks. So 
the the news around Boston continues to be a little consistent heading into the draft. And I suspect a lot will happen in this draft that changes the landscape of the NBA. So um, all of this could be stale or outdated by Friday. But for now, that's where things sit. Um, I want to talk about Isaiah Stewart. But before we do that, Justin, anything I missed with the Globe reporting or any other Celtics news as of late? Uh, nothing that we can't cover in our next segment. Uh, I think it'll be good to zoom through a ton of stuff that's out there right now. And some of it is pretty interesting. Some of it sounds like complete nonsense. Cool. Um, let's let's pause the action and talk about Isaiah Stewart, though, because this has been your off-season muse. And Brian, you actually had a pre-draft workout or a conversation with Although I guess I don't know, maybe <laughs> maybe you got a little story at the same time. Uh, a conversation with Isaiah Stewart. So Justin, first of all, why do you think Boston should target a player like Beef Stew? And then Brian will ask you if Justin's instincts are correct. Well, I mean, for one, the, the, for purely mechanical reasons, uh, the front court rotation is thin. The ability of somebody who can actually hit a three point shot on occasion next to someone like Rob, uh, would be really, really helpful, uh, to keep Al Horford's minutes down because if they don't find someone like that, we know what, uh, Joe Mazzola is going to do with poor Al Horford's legs, which we don't want to have happen. And then from more of a chemistry perspective, many, many, many people have made the correct observation that this is a very nice team other than maybe Marcus Smart and, uh, I don't know, Al Horford when the one day he's actually mad at someone. Apart from that, they really need someone who isn't necessarily exactly an enforcer, though you could argue that Beef Stew could fill that role if he wanted to. He's a little bit more of a finesse player than that. But his intensity is like a big man version of Marcus Smart. And I think that would be an incredibly valuable player to have on this roster. But so do the Pistons. So do the Pistons. Brian, uh, anything Justin missed in terms of Isaiah Stewart's player profile? Not that there's m- much reporting around this. This is really <laughs> Justin's mission this offseason. Yeah, I, I actually want to say uh, specifically that I remember, um, you know, Isaiah Stewart was like the number one, number two player in the country coming out of high school um, and really fell after uh, struggling at Washington. And he was in the wrong defensive system for him. Um, they were playing a lot of zone. It just didn't work for him at all. And he slid a lot in mock projections, sometimes second round. I vividly remember having him mock to Boston every time I did a mock draft at 14, uh, specifically to Boston. Uh, They used to pick on Aaron uh, Neesmith, and obviously it's not uh, what ended up happening. Uh, But now that uh, Detroit has such an overload in the front court, I wouldn't be surprised at all for them to shop him. Uh, When I spoke to Isaiah Stewart, it was was like a a battle rapper. Like the way, the, the candidness that he was giving me was um absolutely insane like i had had never heard anything like this from a prospect the way he was calling people out saying people are ducking me in workouts they're saying he said i'm busted there you know what and and workouts every time they don't want to see me they would they wouldn't play me in games uh you know just all sorts of stuff that like i want it more than everybody like it's he's a lunatic like he really is like a crazy mfr out there and i think that you saw that when he went after lebron james in a way yeah. that we've never seen in LeBron's 20 years in his in the league. Um, you know, this is a guy who's going to put in the work. Uh, this is a guy who's going to bring in a level of intensity. This is a guy who's going to scrap. This is a guy who's going to get in your head. And and I think, you know, the three-point shooting is obviously the swing skill set. But from a culture perspective, I love bringing in Isaiah Stewart and just making them a little crazier. I mean, he's like, he's not he's not mean, but on the court, he definitely is. Um, and especially if you've got Grant Williams too, uh, coming back next year too, with, you know, kind of approaching it from a different angle with more of the like research-based, uh, trash talking and Isaiah Stewart's just straight up trash talking. I think you've got coming at you both from from both corners in the front court. Uh, that, that, that'd be a lot of, a lot of fun. And I think that, um, you know, Isaiah Stewart has had a, I think not underwhelming NBA career, but just, you know, you're not hearing much about it in, in, in Boston, in, in, uh, Detroit. And I think maybe you would hear his name a lot more if he was in a rotation for Boston. Yeah, I hope, I hope the Pistons, whether Beef Stew is part of that team or not, find another gear because it's, it's getting a, a little sad. Okay, a few more pieces of news and then we'll get into this draft stuff. And this is a good bridge. So reportedly, the Indiana Pacers are shopping the number seven pick. They also reportedly have interest in Grant Williams that probably isn't a perfect match, but maybe there's some juice there. Before 
Well, we full Boston into it. Brian, what do you think of Indiana shopping this number seven pick just writ large? Um, I think if uh, Taylor Hendricks or Jarris Walker both get selected uh, before uh, Indiana's on the clock, um, then it makes some sense to me. If either of them were there, I'd be a little bit more surprised, especially Walker. Um, I think I think that uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm personally a little higher I think on Walker than than Hendricks, uh, but I think Hendricks is, is is very good as well. Um, and I think that if I were Indiana, I would just I would just do that. Like I would I would just take either of them. But at the same time, if you look at the physical builds of uh, the guys that Detroit has dropped recently. A lot of guys on the Detroit roster look a lot like Jarris Walker in terms of just being like physically cut and just NFL style bodies. And and Walker, I think, would fit really well with that. Um, Whitmore is the other guy who I think is also just uh, like a hundredth percentile athlete. Um, and also either of the Thompson twins. Um, uh, more so I meant Thompson in terms of the athletics athleticism. But I think that Detroit uh, and Troy Weaver, even so it's this time in Oklahoma City, have really valued athleticism. And so the guys you're going to be looking at in Detroit are going to be Cam Whitmore and then Thompson and Jarris Walker. And so uh, if they land on Walker um, and then let's say one of the next picks is, is Hendricks, then Indiana doesn't have the power for the future that they want. I think that's when they make a trade. But, you know, the reporting suggests that Indiana's looking for, uh, you know, a strong physically built, like, um, you know, not necessarily offense first, power forward, because they have some offense in the backcourt with Halliburton and, um, you know, Benedict Mathurin and all of that. So um, I would I would suggest, you know, keeping that take if those guys are there. But, you know, if if they go beforehand, then see what the value is. But there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of chatter, a lot of picks. So I never know what to make about any of them. Dustin, is there any chance or motivation for Boston to get in on that if that pick becomes available? Well, the only path I could reasonably see for something like that coming available would be a sign and trade of Grant Williams. Presumably they are interested. There's a little bit of reporting as we've, we've touched on about that. He doesn't feel like the kind of player, the more we talk through this with Brian just now, that that would really fit that role. I mean, he's defensive first and he's a really capable defender, but he's also kind of small. And if they're going to get beat up on the boards, that doesn't seem like necessarily the, the very best option that they could go for. Though you could squint and see a starting level player with Grant if you give him enough time but anything like that would be a sign and trade that also involves other assets probably a first round pick that's you know comparably or practically a second round pick uh, going back to them and another interesting player like Sam Hauser and at that point it starts to get kind of like I don't know if it makes sense for Boston to do either so talking through it as interesting as that sounds I don't really think it's super plausible unless it's exactly what the Pacers want my question there would really be if Kevin Pritchard would want to coach Peyton or would want Peyton Pritchard on the roster, just with the <laughs> Pritchard connection. Yeah, <laughs> not thought about that. He hates well, the Celtics. Um, I mean, not enough to not give him Malcolm Brogdon. I don't know. I I have worries about Pritchard, but that, that's another podcast. Okay, a few more newsy things, and then let's get to the lab. So, according to Himmelsbeck, Jan Madar, and ooh, I haven't said your name in a while. I hope I pronounce it right. Uh, Wahan Begerin, the French kid. Juhan Begerin, as far as I know. So, so God, I'm going to Montreal in two weeks. I'm like, it's going to be horrible. Um, they're not going to be at Summer League for Boston, which is a little surprising, I suppose. Um, Brian, will you be at Summer League? Maybe. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I'm also in the maybe camp right now. Uh, okay, last question, and then we'll do an ad read, and then we will talk about Boston's draft day decisions. Just because, Brian, you're dialed into this stuff, and because he's only been in the league for so many years, so it's like almost draft news. Brian, do you think Zion Williamson is a member of the Pelicans on Friday? Why or why not? Uh, I, For the sake of my job, I really hope he is, because I would like to be a part of that news cycle, but Thursday I'll be dancing around the hallways of Barclays Center trying to do a million things at once and we'll be a mess on the news desk at our at our publication if I'm not able to help on that. Uh, so I, I certainly hope that if they trade him, they wait. Um, but, you know, I think there is some smoke to the fire uh, of the Scoot Henderson infatuation. Um, I get it. I fully get it. Um, I'm not a believer in trading an asset at its lowest value. 
Um, and I think this is Zion's lowest value in the league right now. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that you could have gotten more for, I mean, this is the Bradley Beal conversation all over again that I had from earlier today, but I think that you could have gotten more from Zion any other time in his career besides right now. The question is, can it get lower than this? And I think the answer to that is yes. So in that case, I would say that mm, if you think it's going to get worse than this, if you really do, then I would punt and, and get scoot henderson while you can because you probably can get scoot henderson um yeah. like i i do personally believe that charlotte is going to take brandon miller i'm not 100 percent confident on that but i will keep that mock that way until i really hear something otherwise but i i think that you know based on the conversations that i've had it seems it's going to be um brandon miller at two to charlotte now charlotte could trade out that's also an option maybe washington wants to trade up and try to get um scoot as well whatever it might be or brandon um but i think that that charlotte goes with brandon miller and i think that portland would definitely accept an offer uh for zion williamson um for the free pick and whatever other package that would include uh presumably simons um maybe nurkic uh i don't know if they would want to throw in shade and sharp um but i do think that they would uh i do think they would definitely uh try to get zion williamson in a way that other teams maybe wouldn't um Another team that I really wouldn't be shocked to see with with uh, Zion Williamson would be Houston. You know, they're going for it yeah. next year, I think. Um, they've got a lot of assets to consolidate. Um, and I think that, you know, with James Harden potentially coming, likely coming, um, you know, and the pick being owed to Oklahoma City next year, more likely than not, you know, that four pick um, would also be an interesting option uh, to consider, uh, as well as some of the other, you know, tertiary assets. Now, the guy at that point that I really wouldn't want to give up from Houston is Tari Eason. Um, I'm a huge Tari Eason believer. I think that he's really, really underrated. Um, when I uh, when I interviewed Ernie Johnson, I asked if there's anybody in the league that he um, kind of just wanted to shout out, and Tari Eason was the one player Ernie Johnson mentioned, too. I think that Tari mm-hmm. needs to get a little bit more love than he's getting. I think that um, he had a season kind of similar to Herb Jones uh, during Herb's rookie year, and Herb got a lot of shine for it. Um, and Tari didn't. And I think that it makes sense. Houston was kind of a dumpster fire last year. But um, I think that uh, I would I would really try to hold on to Tari Eason if I'm Houston. As for, you know, some of the other guys on that Houston roster, I think pretty much everybody uh, would be pretty expendable if I've got now a core of James Harden and Zion Williamson and probably at least some of the assets that I was able to hold on to. So, um, yeah, I think that that's kind of what I'd be thinking. I think that ultimately New Orleans gets cold feet and doesn't do anything because it's a really big move to trade someone as, you know, franchise altering as I am Williamson. Um, unless you're really, really sure that you, that Scoot Henderson is that guy for you. And as far as I know, Scoot hasn't had a workout with the Pelicans or anything. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think he's been, I don't think he's been to the facility. Maybe they're able to like really sneak one in privately under the radar in the next like day or two. Um, although Scoot's already probably in New York. So. If they really want him, you know, they'll get eyes on him. They'll get his medical, whatever. But there aren't really medical concerns with Scoot too much. I mean, he missed some of the season, but mostly it was just like, let's just kind of shut it down. Um, so I don't think there are too many real actual concerns here. So I'm uh, I'm really curious to see what New Orleans does. I think I would hold, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't blame them for trading. Yeah, I, I intellectually agree with all of that, but... Zion's averaged like 24 games a season. I mean, I know it's, it hasn't been that long, but I don't know. There's something about <clears throat> that relationship that seems impossible to imagine succeeding moving forward. But this is not the Pelicans Lab podcast. This is the Celtics Lab podcast. So we don't have to dwell on it. I am going to pause the action and talk about our friends over at FanDuel. And then we will hop into the lab portion of the programming. And we will talk all about the 2023 draft and the number 20. 20- 35 pick, which the Boston Celtics, uh, for the moment, anyways, to own. Baseball season is in full swing, and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets. If your first bet doesn't win, just go to fanduel.com slash Boston to join today. And I have to say, uh, betting on this baseball season feels impossible because first it's the Cincinnati Reds and now the, maybe the Phillies are going to get hot. And I just, I don't really have a bead on this. Brian, who's your baseball team? I don't think I know that. 
I'm a lifelong New York Mets fan to the point where I have a, Ooh, I'm sorry a, I crying, <laughs> a crying Mr. Met tattooed on my arm. So beautiful. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm actually from LA, uh, so being a Mets fan is uh, especially weird. Um, but I live here now, and uh, they're awful. Yep, they're. <laughs> it's a good word to describe it. Well, anyways, whether it's the Mets or any other baseball team or any other summer sport for that matter. Don't miss a chance to snag a no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash Boston to sign up. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission. You must be 21 plus and present in Massachusetts. First online real money wager only. $10 deposit is required. Refund is issued as a non-withdrawable bonus bet that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at FanDuel.com slash sportsbook. Hope is here. Can like help line ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. Play it smart from the start. Go to gamesensema.com or call 1-800-GAM-1234. Okay, Brian. The Boston Celtics have the number 35 pick in the 2023 NBA draft. And unless they are being really, really sneaky, we don't really think that they're looking at trading up. Although anything's possible. Again, they don't operate in a in a vacuum. I mean, it depends on what the other teams are going to be up to. Um, it's also the new CBA. Everyone is kind of feeling out what that means and how valuable long-term price fixed assets matter. Um, I'll just say off the jump, because this is like really my only contribution to the conversation, and then I'm just going to kind of quarterback that for people who are curious, here's some notable number 35 picks in recent NBA history. Draymond Green. Uh, Nemanja Bielitsa, DeAndre Jordan, Glenn Davis, PJ Tucker, Carlos Boozer, and Rick Mahorn, and then plenty of other guys I'd never heard of. So uh, you can certainly make magic with the 35 picks. You can also, like most picks, uh, swing and a miss, or you can find a fine player too. Anyways, Brian, before we get into the types of players or the names um, that might make sense for Boston in this position, uh, is there any chance that you think they move up or back or out entirely? Uh, yeah, there's a chance. I mean, um, let's say, especially with, uh, you know, Andre Jackson, who's the guy who I have uh, being mocked to the Celtics right now, they decide that they really have him as the guy. They fell in love with him during the workout that he had with them. And they're like, you know what? We really think he's the one. And they're getting rumors that he's going to go at 27, 28. Sure. Why not? You know, throw Throw in Peyton Pritchard, we talked about earlier, and, and move up to get on Peyton wants it anyway. Maybe mm-hmm. throw in a future, you know, conditional pick somewhere or a couple second rounders and move up. Uh, because if you're only moving up a few picks at that point, it's not the end of the world, and you're still getting the guy you want. And, and I, I could see, I mean, Andre Jackson just won a national championship. Like I could see, I could see why a team maybe fell in love with him. A different team fell in love with him during the pre-draft process enough so that he's a first round pick in their eyes. Especially if you believe in that jumper potentially coming around eventually. I mean, he's definitely a first round pick. Um, if you buy him as a guy with a jumper, then he's probably a top 15 or top 20 player in this class. Now, most people do not buy that he'll ever get a jumper. And in that case, he is closer to where the Celtics are picking in the early second round. Um, but he can do everything else. And and so I think that, um, yeah, if the Celtics fall in love with one of those guys and, and, and they're available a little bit ahead, or maybe they start seeing a guy falling and they're like, you know what? We we really liked our conversation with uh, Trace Jackson Davis, but realistically, like we can maybe get him at forty five. We don't need to use the thirty second pick or whatever the Celtics have uh, on him right now. So um, yeah, I think I think there's always a always an option to, to trade up, trade out. Um, wouldn't be surprised at all, and uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be disappointed. I think for the fan base, you know, to see to see any of those options happen, because I think that um, for me in this draft class after. A certain number they're all kind of in the same range for me and yeah. obviously there's different tiers to everything but um you know I, there, there are guys who some evaluators might have at 32 and some might have at 45 or some might have at 15 and i could i would probably say to each of them like i see i see your point i can see why you would feel that way uh kind of just depends on you know who's drafting and what the fit is and why you might like that guy um based off of the conversations that you've had and based off of uh, the evaluation models that you use. And so, um, you know, I think I've got my ways of evaluating prospects that make certain guys pop. And um, I'm sure the Celtics do too. So uh, I'm very sure the Celtics do too. If they are actually an NBA team, then I am uh, just 
a blogger for the most part. So um, yeah, I think uh, I think that I think that it, it would not be surprising to see Boston make some moves. But if I'm looking at teams that are going to make moves, if I'm going to power rank them, uh, Boston is like 17 in terms of most likely to do something on draft night. Like they're they're not one of the teams that I'm really expecting to make a splash or move up or move you know move out or whatever it is. You know, I think uh, you know teams like Houston and Indiana and Portland and um, just across the board, I think they're just other teams that I would project more likely uh, to do that. Sure. Uh, Brian, we have a bunch of names that I want to ask you about specifically, but Justin, just based on what you know about the team and also if you've heard any uh, reporting as such, what kinds of players do you think Boston is targeting with this pick? Um, and specifically, what kinds of players are they not targeting? Well, they're not targeting guards, which uh, considering the makeup of the roster and where they're going to be drafting, uh, makes a lot of sense. They don't need, I mean, they have two guys that we just talked about, uh, Johan Begerin and uh, Yamadar, who are not going to be playing in summer league because there's literally no reason for them to. They're not going to come over and play any meaningful minutes on this particular iteration of the ball club. That could potentially change, but honestly, I would be more surprised or more expecting to see them part of a draft deal, uh, draft day deal to move up or down, something like that, because mm-hmm. those kinds of players eventually might be useful for, for a team trying to save some money on some depth pieces. But what they have been doing is working out wings and bigs, which are what the team needs. So, I mean, that's kind of just like a no, no brainer right there. They are planning intelligently for depth needs for people who would be older players, as as Brian talked about uh, earlier, who have some experience and could conceivably do something on the court for them this year. I don't know why they have Justin Champagne. I mean, they're they're fine. Um, Brian, I have some names in particular to ask you about, but first let me pause the action again and talk about our friends over at BetterHelp, which is a sponsor, (coughs) excuse me, that we're happy to work with. What they do is they help you in that lifelong process of kind of growing and changing and getting to know yourself. And that starts by an online survey to, to match you with a, using a questionnaire to match you with a therapist, a licensed therapist, and importantly, you can switch at any time. And so it gives you the flexibility to, you know, deepen your self-awareness. It gives you the flexibility to talk about when times are tough. It gives you the flexibility to talk about when things are going well. Um, as we've discussed in these ad reads before, therapy is not just about doom and gloom or when when uh, there are storm clouds, but it can be when things are popping and you just need someone to help you scaffold your thinking. So um, we're happy to partner with BetterHelp and we think that it's a service that really makes it easy to get into online therapy in a flexible, convenient way. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, you should give BetterHelp a try. Again, it's entirely online. It's convenient. It's flexible. And it's suited to your schedule. So. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash selflab and get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selflab. Okay, Brian. Um, Andre Jackson is a kid from UConn uh, who's a wing and that fits, I think, what we think, which is wings and bigs are going to be a theme here. Um, I have a few names. I'll go through them. You can give me 10 seconds or 10 minutes, depending on how excited you are for this person potentially becoming a member of the Boston Celtics. Tell me about Jordan Walsh, who's a wing from Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, first, let me talk a little bit about Andre Jackson, um, if you don't mind, because I do I do really like that fit. I don't um, mind. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Andre, you know, we touched on him for a second before beforehand, just in, in the in the abstract about why a team might want to trade up. But, you know, he is one of those guys who could do everything. Um, you know, to, I, I actually compared him uh to uh, like an efficient version of Russell Westbrook uh Ooh. in terms of what Russell Westbrook was this year uh which is like a very strange comparison because when you think Russell Westbrook you think of the MVP or you think of like the worst version of him when he was uh, just chucking shots but he he was a low usage maybe not efficient because he's not actually efficient as a scorer, but he's not going to be taking as many shots as Westbrook. He doesn't want the ball as much, but in terms of like athleticism and will to win and just give 110% and, uh, you know, d- defense. And my favorite thing about Jackson is his playmaking. Um, I think he's one of the best transition assist guys in this draft class, if not number one. Um, and that's on the wing. So, you know, you're going to have a some tertiary playmaking there. 
Um, he is one of the leaders in like passes per touch. Um, so he's going to keep that ball moving, uh, even though he's not going to be your true point guard. I don't think um, he's going to be someone where the ball doesn't stop when you when, when it gets to him. You know, it's going to keep the ball moving, find the open shooter. That's what happened with uh, you know UConn on their run to the national championship. You know, setting a lot of uh, setting up a lot of actions for for Jordan Hawkins, who I think is uh, the best movement shooter in this class. And you know, I think you you put Jackson with somebody like Tatum or Brown or. Shoot, even Sam Hauser, honestly, and then you can get some some really nice stuff going on uh, in the minutes that they're playing. Um, Jordan Walsh is, is somebody who I've been a lot, lot lower on than consensus throughout the entire process. Um, he's somebody who, to me, doesn't really pop analytically. Uh, the numbers just don't have anything that really suggests this is like somebody who's really just a sleeper hiding in plain sight. Um, it's It's just at that point, you know, how much you believe in the high school productivity and how much you believe uh, in what you've seen on film, because there are flashes with him. Um, and I think that Boston has drafted that way in the past. You've seen guys who, you know, were McDonald's all Americans who slid in the draft a little bit. I think, you know, Romeo Lanford was a pick like that, if I remember correctly. Um, and I think we've seen Boston kind of use that in the past. Now I'm not sure if that was more of a Danny Ainge thing, or if that was somebody else in Boston's front office that valued that kind of thinking, but Walsh fits that category. Um, he like Jackson is somebody will who who with a jumper um is is a top 20 25 guy in this class um I've talked to scouts who don't have him in their top 60 um and so oh, I think yeah I think with Walsh uh it it really depends on uh how much he wants it um and his work ethic and how much he's willing to put in and uh candidly like I don't know. Like I, I've never met Jordan Walsh. I've never spoken to him. I, I've not. He was not one of the prospects that I interviewed. Um, but you know, he's he's not also somebody who I've heard. Like you know, there's some prospects where you start asking scouts like who's somebody that you've heard is like sleeping in the gym, and and his name isn't one of the names that I've heard mentioned. But that doesn't mean he's not doing that. Um, so you know, I think that Jordan Walsh comes down to just how much he wants it, and I think that. Uh, there are a lot of guys we've seen drafted in the second round who have really exceeded their uh, expectations. Draymond Green at 35 being one of them because Draymond was a lunatic who wanted it a ton. <laughs> and so if Jordan Walsh is really going to put in that effort to improve his jumper, he's got the physical tools to be a really special NBA player. He is huge. I mean, I could probably pull up his measurements if I have one moment to do it. But when I was uh, you know, texting people who were at the Combine, a lot of people were saying Jordan Walsh looks every bit the measurements that he is. And so what I yeah, what I got here is a 6'6 six, six, uh, in socks, 7'2 wingspan. He's got a 33-inch standing vert, which is 91st percentile, 10.83 second lane agility, which is 86th percentile. So fast, vertical pop, um, long, 204 pounds. So he's got some build to him. His closest physical comps, according to Stadium Speak, are Kelly Oubre Jr., Dorian Finney-Smith, um, you know, guys who, who Herb, Herbert Herb Jones, um, guys who have played you know high level in the NBA, uh, especially on the defensive end. Um, so I, I I think that Jordan Walsh has the the physical build to to make it work. Um, and if he wants to you know get to that next level, you know, I think that you know it's butts up to Boston uh, to see if he, he's there. But I, I think. Candidly, like I do think he'll be on the clock. Um, or I think he'll be available when Boston's on the clock. Um, and you know, at that point, he's one of the highest recruits, uh, recent, you know, who who from last year who will still be who, who will still be available. Uh, so Boston should at least uh consider it. Yeah, and Boston is a bona fide contender with a really great G League team. So it it seems to me that uh, JD Davison know. fits that too, right? Right. Yeah. So thing of either, a, it feels kind of icky to call a kid a project, but someone who's a little more raw, Boston has the infrastructure and the, the timeline to take a chance on that, maybe more than other teams. Okay. Uh, let's talk about this kid from Princeton. He's a forward and I, I'm procrastinating to trying to stay his name. We'll Tosin. just call him Tosin. Yeah. It's, uh, it's to- it's, Tosin. It's too, me, it's, okay. Yeah. Was it not Tosin? I mean, it's not Tosin. I mean, I could say, I, I, would, you, would you want to give it a shot? I want to give it a shot. <laughs> is Tosan right? right? Give, give me the, is Tosan right? I think it's Tucson. Oh, okay. okay. Well, then I'm then I'm out. I, I bail. You go. Uh, it's Tucson or Wilma. Oh, Wilma, I would never have guessed that. 
Oh man, thank you for saving me, Brian. My name is Teba Tabai. I'm allowed to poke fun at people's names, I have decided. Okay, uh, Tucson, apologies. Kid from Princeton, off we go. Yeah, uh, Tucson Aloma was one of my breakout stars of uh, the um, March Madness process. Um, I did a little video on him. I don't uh, really um, think he got the shine that he deserved for that Princeton team that really made a run. Um, and, and, you know, knocked off some real contenders. I, I believe they beat Purdue. Um, and I think that, uh, he was a, he was a huge part of that. Um, you know, he is a point forward. Um, he's one of the guys that, uh, kind of like Andre Jackson pops analytically for me for that exact reason, because he is, uh, tall and long and can play make. Um, he would have massively high usage rate, uh, at Princeton. So that would not be the case at, um, uh, you know, the Celtics. Um, and I think he could potentially be available as an undrafted free agent as well. Uh, but at the same time, like, I think I, I am going to be a firm believer that he's a draftable uh, player, six, seven in socks, seven, one wingspan. Um, he's, he's somebody who's uh, standing vert of uh, 30.5 inches with 72nd percentile. Um, so he's got some athleticism. Um, his physical comps are Kenneth Fareed. Um, Trevor Ariza, uh, Luol Deng, uh, and and I think that you know really for me it's it's just that playmaking uh, and that and that defensive versatility. Um, he's 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 not Draymond Green because you hear height and you hear playmaking and you hear defense and you think Draymond Green, but I think he's in that same mold as somebody like a Draymond Green or a Jeremy Sohan or you know one of those guys who can come in and um, you know sort of play almost like a like a Jay Crotery type of a role. Um, he's got to hit that jump shot as well. Um, and he's, he's older, like he's definitely one of the older prospects in this class. Um, and I think he can play so many different positions. He's just somebody who I think is just a good, uh, bench depth guy. So at the end of the day, I think that he's, um, he's a really interesting guy, man. I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's British from the United Kingdom, um, Ivy league, which is, uh, obviously, you know, rare as well. So British Ivy league, uh, prospect, it's just, you know, he's got a different story than the rest of the players. Um, and yeah, I think that he's somebody who, uh, I would definitely take a, take as a, as a pick, um, or at least a hard look at as an undrafted free agent. Um, if I were, uh, if I were in a front office. Interesting. All right. Um, let's keep it moving. We got Jalen Slauson next on our list. What do you know about Jalen? Yeah. Jalen Slauson was a huge breakout star for me in the tournament, but I had him as actually as somebody who I had on my mock in 2022 at a He's somebody who, if you ever use the website Bart Torvik and you use the queries they have to be like guys who have reached this threshold of defensive rebounds and this and this and that, they love Jalen Slauson. He is somebody who just beats every possible uh, like check mark you could want out of a prospect. He, he fills up the stat sheet. Um, he's also one of the older prospects in this class, um, but you know he's also I think one of the most versatile and one of the most efficient. Um, you know, he went on a personal 9-0 run against Virginia uh, during the first game of the tournament when Furman beat Virginia, which was a huge upset. Um, you know, he had a three, a three and one. And um, my one of my favorite stats about him is he's one of just eight players in college basketball since 2008 to record at least 100 dunks and 300 and, and 100 three pointers while in college. So uh, to me, to reach those thresholds good. of both 100 dunks and 100 three pointers suggests that you can shoot and you're athletic. And I want both of those things. For a guy who I want in my rotation who can just play spot minutes, give me the guy who can shoot and is athletic, he'll probably be able to hold his own. Um, he's got a good block rate, good steal rate, good assist rate, uh, good advanced stats for like box plus minus, that kind of thing. Um, you know, he's going to be one of the older guys in the class uh, for sure as well. Um, but somebody who I, I think is just uh, worth drafting um and i think he's gonna find his way onto an nba roster sooner or later even if he's not someone who hears his name uh called on draft night um i wouldn't be surprised if he's one of those guys who's like you know what don't draft me i'll sign with where i want to sign um like austin reeves did a couple of years ago or fred van vliet did as well i mean both those guys obviously wanted to be drafted but were able to choose their destiny a little bit too so um i would definitely keep uh keep an eye on jalen slots and the, the Celtics brought him in for a workout and i think he's uh He's really just uh, somebody who's who's uh, worth considering because he he checks a lot of boxes. I have to say, um, the Austin Reeves getting a shoe deal is 
so wacky to me, but I really like the shoes. So I guess the proof's in the pudding. Um, Brian, any other players in this category that either you think Boston is looking at or has worked out with or talked to or ought to get that done sometime between now and Thursday? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the guys that they're looking at seem to be strong defense guys. You know, the guys that we mentioned were all strong defense guys. Another guy that's a really strong defender is Leaky Black um, from UNC, who is another older prospect who was, uh, you know, a longtime strong defender. Um, Oscar Shibwe is a, you know, national player of the year who they brought in as well. Um, that's at least worth considering. Uh, Chris Livingston was a five-star recruit out of Kentucky. I'm not a huge believer in Chris Livingston. I don't think he, I don't I don't really tend to like guys who haven't been productive in college um, at all. But um, you know, five star guy who who's got the right athletic builds, and you know, he decided to keep keep his name in the draft. I imagine for a reason. So um, when you can get a, a highly touted prospect like that in the second round, it's at least worth considering. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that. You know, we've touched on some some good guys. I think that Trace Jackson Davis from Indiana is the other one that I would really consider as well as like a, a top, you know, marquee guy. He's another guy who kind of is in that sort of Memphis grizzlies uh type of mold where it's like can do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, good playmaking at the position in the front court. Can't really shoot, unfortunately, um, but is very efficient when he's on the court. Um, and he's just uh, somebody who I think could could be like a real, you know, um, veteran type personality, uh, without necessarily, um, having a veteran experience in the NBA. Uh, you know, he kind of fits to me in that, like, um, Jeremiah Robinson, Earl, like Xavier Tillman type of mold of just power forwards who came into the league and you think they've played the league five, 10 years already, even though they've have been in the league like one or two years only. Um, I think that trace is kind of next in that lineage. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, we have a few more names on our list, Brian. I'll keep picking your brain, but Justin, is there anyone either that we have talked about that you all down on or remaining in our notes that uh, tickles your fancy? I really like the idea of Tucson. I don't have to get used to saying his name. Uh, obviously, as a UConn junkie, I'm a big Andre Jackson fan. Uh, I don't think he's going to be drafted just because he's kind of in a weird tweener mole. He's a little too short uh, to be the kind of guy that really has a better chance of making it in the NBA, but his touch around the rim is so good. And he's another UConn guy, which of course, you know, makes me incredibly biased. Uh, Adama Sonogo is someone I think the Celtics should keep an eye on as an undrafted guy for that new third uh, two-way player development slot. Yeah. I mean, I think Sonogo has the best touch at the rim in, in this class. Um, at least the numbers suggest as much. Like he he really is a is an awesome rim finisher. Um, you know, between him and Oscar Shibwe, like, yeah, it's in, it's worth at least considering because you know, Shibwe has got some of the best rebounding instincts you'll ever encounter. Uh, and Sonoga has some of the best touch around the rim you'll you'll see. Um, I I I don't necessarily think I'd use a draft pick on either of them, but I would definitely keep an eye on both of them for undrafted free agents. Um and uh was there anybody else that you just mentioned just now? Uh, I talked about the Tucson Utah guys. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them out of the way so we can talk about the uh, people they might actually draft or take. Yeah, Brian, any other names? Well, my computer's screaming that my internet is unstable. Um, any other names on your list that uh, might end up in a Boston Celtics uniform or a main Celtics yeah, uniform? Yeah, one one guy that I think you guys should uh, be looking at is Jaime Hawkins Jr. Um, you know, if he's uh, if he's still available. Uh, a lot of the intel on him is that he's killed it during the pre-draft process. Um, but he's just somebody who I think uh, is is a winner. Um, and I know that uh, that's something that kind of I didn't really believe in before uh, I became more of a draft guy. In the last few years, the more I've really followed this, the more I've been like, no, that's a real thing. Uh, there, there's winning players and there's losing players. And I think Tommy Hawk is mm-hmm. like is a winning player. Um, he He's got... Uh, he's just, he's just, to me, I think he just projects as such a great glue guy at the next level. Um, might not necessarily be somebody you would uh, have as one of your first seven guys in your rotation necessarily. Um, but I think, you know, in, in the minutes he's on the court, he's going to provide valuable minutes. Um, and I think that, you know, he's, he's somebody who, uh, you know, scored a lot from the post when he was in college. It's not going to really, uh, be the way he's going to be able to score in the NBA, 
but at the same time, he just uh, he, he's just somebody who I think is going to translate. He's going to find a way. Um, so if he's available, uh, I would I would take a hard look at Jaime Hawkins out of UCLA. Also, uh, another Triple J. Great name. Um, all right, Brian, you've been working hard enough, and also we kind of have similar bosses. That I'm going to let you, I'm going to clear the way, and I'm going to let you plug everything you've been working on for the past week and what you'll be working on on Thursday. So tell the people where they can find you. Yeah, uh, I am at for the win ftw.usatoday.com. Um, I have been hosting a show called Prospect Park, uh, which has uh, been really fun. I've had conversations with uh, several draft prospects, including Omax Prosper, Derek Lively, Chris Murray, Noah Clowney, Nick Smith Jr., Max Lewis, and Brandon Pachemski. Um, so I think that's the nine for this class. Um, usually, uh, I've done more, but this year we got, um, videos produced for all of them, which has been great. And, uh, we've got, you know, on camera interviews with each of these guys and, um, you know, good, uh, you know, good information and stats about them for scouting reports. So if you're interested in any of those prospects, uh, you know, got, uh, a lot of uh, information for you there. Uh, I'll have mock drafts, you know, between now and, and Thursday as well. And then I'll be off the red carpet. Uh, for the draft and we'll have some access to some players beforehand um, including something tomorrow with I said I think Grady Dick and I think uh, there should be some some more stuff on Thursday that I don't know what will happen yet that I'll have more stuff though because I'll be there um, so we'll uh, we'll figure it out when it happens but yeah until then just following the NBA draft cycle uh, for for the win at your site today.com Okay, hold yeah, on. If you, if you need draft is a pod, is a podcast. Um, it is not a podcast. It's uh, it's just like a video series that I've been doing uh for Twitter and for YouTube and for Instagram and for uh, our our WordPress. It looks like we just lost Cameron, uh, but let me go ahead and say that if you want like more detailed information about the NBA draft, that's exactly where you want to go. Uh, your past interviews have been invaluable to me. I mean, we, we, we talked about one of them today with beef stew. Uh, I encourage everyone to jump out and go on Twitter. Uh, what's your Twitter handle exactly again? Just can you spell it out so we can it's find you there? My too? exact, it's my exact name. So if you see it in the description, that's uh, probably easier. Brian Kabrowski. Cool. Am I back? Am, do I have audio and video? Yes, you are. Brian, Prospects Park is such a funny name. That's all I wanted to say. That's yeah. for non-coastal elites. Brian lives in uh, Brooklyn and there's a Prospect Park. We're talking about draft prospects. That is categorically the best name you could have come up with. I'm so happy my internet kicked back on so that I could Thank compliment you, you as uh, emphatically as I feel that. <laughs> I appreciate it. It is uh it is worth noting that I did come up with the name myself and you are the only one to comment on it at all. Uh, no yeah. one has said anything. I think they just kind of thought it was, uh, I think everybody has thought it was just like, a, 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 just an alliteration, but no, it's a reference, obviously. And uh, I have not, I have not had anybody besides you say anything positive about it. So thank you for that. <laughs> Two peas in a pod, baby. Um, I thought good. Celtics Lab is fine and easy to understand, but Prospects Park is... Okay. Um, I'm so happy that my internet came back so I can tell you that face to face. All right. Um, so check out Brian's work. I think we've made it clear where to find him and we've made it clear that he's the guy for you this week. This episode of the Celtics Lab podcast is brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive dream partner of the CLNS Media Network and BetterHelp. You deserve to be happy, Brian. We will see you, I'm sure, on Twitter on Thursday, maybe in Vegas this summer, and if not, in the funny pages. Thanks for coming on. Sounds good. Great. Thanks for having me, guys. Anytime. All right, everyone. Uh, we'll see you with them. See you next episode. We'll talk about whatever happened with this pick. Until then, like and subscribe. And um, adios. CLNS Media Celtics coverage is brought to you by FanDuel. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. 